Welcome to this talk. So uh, today we're going to talk about reactive helidon, actually. Um, so you're kind of a very brave to talk, to, to listen to something that is not so much popular, but believe me, that's going to be a very interesting talk. We do a very interesting comparisons today. Probably I'm the only one who's going to show you this slide today because I work for Oracle and we have to show this slide. Uh, but it's going to be a short one. So yes, my name is Dimitri. I come from Oracle. I work for Oracle and I work for a wonderful product of, Herid of Helidon. But I come to you from Bulgaria, just from the other side of Europe, you know, where you <laughs> south part of Europe. And uh, it's also so hot as here. So we're sharing the same weather. And uh, I'm part of the Bulgarian Java user group, so many greetings from Bulgarian Java user group to uh, your wonderful conference. So uh, before actually jumping into Helidon and reactive Helidon, so I would like to actually a little bit remind you what reactive is. So actually, you know, um, there is this um, uh, like report about how much information we have to process each year, and you see it like grows exponentially. So, and we expect it to grow exponentially. So. And you know, since the Moore's law is a little bit like, you know, not the same as it was, we cannot handle all these big volumes of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, information coming. And that's why we started like doing tricks to utilize as much possible of the resources that we have. And uh, you know, every time that we actually do multi-threaded programming, like, you know, we submit some information to another thread, we make it process it somehow, uh, but we still wait uh, for this processed information to come back, and there are some gaps, you know, in uh, in uh, in uh, you know threads. We we can use them, and actually uh, back in in uh, 2000, I guess 16, back in uh, well, you know, as Java 8 was released then. So I have some talk at DevOps conference, I guess, when I, I tried to like make people think asynchronously in Java 8 because Java 8 provided something called completable futures, which actually solved this problem at some point, you know, because um, uh, one of the, you know, ways to deal with such a great amount of information was to make it asynchronous. So that means that as your, like, code is, did its job, it just have to remind you that, okay, notify you that, okay, I'm done, do something with what I've done. And it all leaded up to something which was probably uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of you know programming effective, but it was completely useless and completely unreadable. And completable the future kind of solved this situation with uh, bringing all this uh, coding model. But uh, to uh, continue actually the uh, the uh, the evolution of the way we think. Um, and the way we actually uh, do our job and do it effectively, uh, the uh, uh, reactive programming was born. So I just copy pasted this from uh, this from the Wikipedia. So uh, uh, it's it's considered as a reactive paradigm uh, with with propagation of streams and propagation of uh, of changes. So that means that we start thinking in data as a data stream like a stream of event that something is changing, something is happening. And we started like uh, thinking not in static ways like arrays, but uh, like events and event emitters and data stream, um, which can communicate between each other to actually uh, create a normal flow of changes and make it the most effective way. Of course, like everything which is good, it has to have a manifesto. It's still available in the internet, by the way. Uh, so you can read it. So, uh, and the main idea is, once again, whenever you do reactive stuff, by the way, many people call it like a functional plus plus. So I'll put a star here. Um, uh, Dr. Venkrat Subrabanyam, who's been here at this conference, I guess, and uh, he also did this talk. So you probably, uh, if you want to hear about what actually reactive is, his talk is the best explanation, so it's a kind of a functional plus-plus way, with the main idea that your code has to be responsive, resilient, like message-driven, and, uh, and, and elastic, it has to scale a lot. So, uh, 
general understanding that you have three flows of events that happen to your code. So first of all is the data actually that is that is uh, that are you processing uh, that actually does not block. It's 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 uh, it's flowing and it's processing. Then you have another channel which is like a separate channel to where you declare that the like you know the uh, data stream is like completed that you processed it. And uh, gracefully, of course, you should handle errors. That means that whenever you have uh, an error, some kind of a, a situation, you, you have a graceful way to control how you handle these errors. So this is like a very general understanding of uh, what reactive itself is. So once again, I, I'm not going to talk about what is reactive. I'm mostly focusing how we do this in Helidon and why we actually came to this situation and when we, when we, how we come to this uh, idea. As an evolution, our next initiative came is the Reactive Streams Initiative to provide a, like a standard way of asynchronous stream processing. So we have a lot of data, streaming a lot of data. Like, you know, of course, not, not, not only Netflix streams a lot of, you know, useless things, but, uh, or Stranger Things, what was this? Useless thing or Stranger Things, what is it? <laughs> yes, uh, so a lot of information is coming and you, you have to process it. And uh, you have to process it most of the in asynchronous way once again to save resources and to do more processing. And uh, once again, um, uh, the idea is that now it's not only a lot of data which has been processed, but we can tell our server how much data can we consume. And here we come to the situation, to the paradigm that we also introduce back pressure. So we can talk to our server that, okay, I can consume so much data, please don't send me any more, I first have to process this thing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> actually, once again, there is a, a website uh, initiative uh, which actually describes reactive streams as a, uh, uh, a way to provide a fully non-blocking and asynchronous uh, way of processing of big volumes of data. So these are like just a little bit reminders of you what is reactive. Uh, it, it's very, very, you know, a brief explanation. <coughs> and why actually it is good. Um, so uh, it's, as I told you, in Java 8, we actually, uh, there were completable features introduced to like a little bit better work with, um, with uh, multi-threaded environments. Uh, so you can easily like push your work somewhere in the, as a completable future and get the result out of it. So you technically can do multi-threaded programming without actually doing multi-threaded programming. But in Java 8, uh, uh, as a, uh, Reactive itself actually came to came to uh, the world. Uh, four interfaces were introduced, just once again to help us developers uh, work better with these data streams in a reactive way. So uh, these four interfaces are subscriber, you know, so you can just uh, subscriber subscribes to a publisher for callbacks. So whenever a publisher does publish some change, some event, as I told you, we think in events here, and the subscriber consumes it somehow. Subscription is a link between them, so it's an abstraction that there is a publisher and there is a uh, subscriber, and in the middle sits the processor. That means that you all not only like read and consume data, but you also can alter it uh, 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 as it like being streamed. Once again, uh, Many people think that, okay, just implement these interfaces and it will work. No, actually, uh, uh, these interfaces are mostly required for you to, uh, not to, even not for you, mostly for library writers or for framework writers who will have a standard way of uh, working with publishers and subscribers for uh, like uh, users of it, for like consumers of, uh, of this, uh, this frameworks, uh, libraries, or whatever it is. There are so-called reactive stream operators. That means that you are able to do it in normal, like, you know, human readable way. So once again, this is like the foundation of it. 
And here comes the idea that there are several uh, reactive engine implementations that actually work with that. You probably know very good uh, uh, Spring uh, Reactor, so it's famous, it's wonderful, it's, it's amazing. RxJava is quite famous uh, here. EchoStreams, like you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit different, but like a big, big, uh, it's a separate model, yes, yeah, so with, uh, with, uh, to work with uh, events sourcing, streaming, et cetera, et cetera. Even Apple have its service stock. And uh, the guys from Red Hat now have this uh, Munity. I think I said it correct. I was on another conference and I said it wrong way. I have special, like, you know, you said it wrong from the creator of this library. <laughs> so I hope that I said it right, right now. And of course, there's another implementation, which is called Halidon. So this comes from the actually name of that talk, Going Reactive with Halidon. And most probably you wonder what Halidon is, and uh, let me give a small introduction of, of, of it and why it is actually uh, uh, maybe interesting for you. And uh, have you been to the previous uh, JBCN conference at all? So how many of you have been to a previous JBCN? So several of you. And there was a previous big talk about Halidon, but it was just an introduction talk. So I will do a small introduction about what Halidon is and uh, how we deal with reactive and should we actually uh, continue dealing with Reactive. Uh, so, uh, uh, as I told you, I work in, Hel in Oracle, so Oracle uh, has its own project called a set of libraries for developing microservices. So, yes, technically it may sound like, uh, like a framework, but actually you can reuse many of its components independently. And Helidon, I like its name very much because it means small swallow, like a small bird. Uh, you probably see it's very fast maneuverable and very cute. And as it flies in the clouds, you know, cloud is a keyword here, not the other one. So you have a good association, like bird flying in the clouds. Fast, maneuverable, cool, and uh, makes it even cooler because it's open source. It's one of the first products that actually Oracle open sourced. Uh, and it's available in GitHub. You just go there and take a look at it. It's built on top of Netty. That means it's uh, asynchronous, and it's cloud native ready. That means that it's not only like serving your REST uh, like uh, endpoints, it has all the infrastructure around it, so you have health metric tracing, and technically it is one of the few frameworks, sets of libraries, that has one of the best graph VM native image support. 99, I guess, percent of the code can be compiled in, in native image, so which makes it even faster. So whenever I show you some numbers, you see that three diagrams here. One of them is just a fat jar with, uh, with, with your software and uh, that, you, that, you, that you run it the way you just uh, like an like executable jar. Other thing is that you, ha you compile it to native image and in the middle you have this J-Link. That means that from the very beginning, Halidon is, is modular. Modular means that we are utilizing this modularity that comes after Java 11. And that means that you can create your custom images with, uh, with uh, Halidon and JVM. So you just throw away the code you don't use. And uh, this is quite advanced. And by the way, another thing is that, uh, as I told you, this Flow API, Halidon 2.0 already has, it's actually built on this, uh, this uh, uh, interfaces. So many of the frameworks that I told you, they actually migrate to these interfaces, but Helena already uses them since the very beginning. So once again, it utilizes uh, modularity, which is cool, awesome, a little bit hard to understand sometimes. <laughs> um, but it uses native image, and you know, it's, it's very, very modern. And if we take a look at the architecture of, uh, of, of Helidon, you see there are actually three main layers there. So Netty, which is like the foundation, which stands uh, for like, you know, uh, doing all this input output for, for the network. And on top of it, as I told you, there's infrastructure to be cloud native ready. We uh, have this Helidon reactive layer. So Helidon from the very beginning is reactive. And uh, it is so nicely done that actually we just made it as a separate product, but a little bit later I will tell you more. And another thing, to be standard, we support the micro-profile way of doing things. 
So have it on MP. And this way, you actually have two ways of coding. So what, what makes Helidon quite unique, you have two flavors, which is like, you know, microprofile way of doing things. So whenever it is a microprofile based code, you just drop in your code and it works because it's standard. And another way is the uh, uh, pure Java reactive way, which is Helidon SE. The only one annotation in Helidon SE is used, it's called overwrite. <laughs> and uh, no other annotation magic, pure Java. And it's, if Helidon MP is fast, Helidon SE is even faster. But let us actually see. Just a small, once again, introduction about Helidon MP. It was pre on previous JBC, uh, B BCN, JBCN, yes, sorry. Uh, on the previous conference, there's a big extended session, so I like encourage you to take a look if you want to have more uh, information about MP. But the idea that there is a specific a set of specification called microprofile. There is another very nice talk happening right now on the other room. <laughs> Sorry, so we're in parallel, uh, which actually with uh, Emily Junk, she talks about actually microprofile. Uh, but once again, it's a set of specification to make your uh, Application run in the cloud, and since microservices are exact, like you know, uh, one of the best uh, uh, representatives of distributed systems. You know, in distributed system, everything can fail uh, independently. So this is the main rule. And to actually work in this system, you have all these thirteen main specifications. Specification means that they're created by community. And there are vendors who implement them. So, like you know, uh, in terms of uh, Helidon, we implement those specifications. It's for tracing, for metrics, for health checks, like you know, um, for uh, security with job propagation and configuration, because you also have to to uh, care about a configuration that is also portable. What does that mean? Whenever you have something, some code which is microprofile based, you drop into uh, micro in, uh, in Helidon, and it will work out of the box. You don't need to rewrite anything. So whenever you switch vendors, you do it the easy way. You don't have to rewrite it. Uh, actually, with Helidon, you get even more. So it's not only microprofile specification. There are some specifications which are also under microprofile umbrella, like GraphQL and LRA. We also do implement it implement them. We also dropped in some Jakarta E specification there. Although we are not certified Jakarta E server, we are not servlet container. But you have you can use, for example, uh, transactions persistence because microservices also read data. And you have it out of the box. And some specific like course and gRPC because people like them. And what is good, what makes it quite unique, that Helen MP has full support for CDI. Well, that means that whenever you have a CDI extension, this is actually the extension mechanism of Helidon. Pure CDI, it's not like vendor specific. If you have a CDI extension, once again, you just drop it in and it works. We wanted to extend something with Neo4j, for example. It has a CDI extension. So the integration with Helidon was just to drop in the CDI extension for Neo4j and it worked. And it even complied with the native image. So um, that's it. it. But once again, there is one small issue, I would say. This all is blocking. That means that you write synchronous code, and that synchronous code, whenever something happens, blocks and waits for this operation to actually finish. And here we come to the interesting part, which is called Helidon Reactive. So as you see from the, from the title of this talk, going reactive with Helidon. And actually, here is this product we call Helidon SE. It's actually the second flavor of Helidon, which makes it quite unique. It's interesting because it's so fast that we call it Welcome to the Danger Zone, like in that movie that actually have a second episode happening like in cinemas right now. So it's, uh, it's really, uh, you just throw away all the magic that you have with CDI, with all of that stuff, with... Uh, with uh, dealing with annotation, et cetera, et cetera, and you have pure reactive Java. Uh, and here the numbers are even, uh, are even smaller, you know. It's okay for us to have applications which are 10 to 15 megabytes native image compiled applications, and uh, they start in milliseconds. Um, and uh, you will be surprised that actually most of you deal with that 
because there's one thing called Oracle Hospitality, and it runs on in practically every hotel in this world. So Helidon is dealing with billions of messages coming from this hospitality platform, and it's made of microservices, which are like tiny, 20 to 15 megabytes, 15 to 20 megabytes, which just handle great volumes of information. And how they handle this information, we're actually gonna talk about it now. <coughs> As Halidon has so-called its own reactive engine. As we were talking to that picture here, well, there's are like like different engines, but they are all like part of some frameworks. Halidon itself, from the very beginning, is based on being reactive itself. So <coughs> Halidon has its own set of reactive operators that have no other dependencies from like other, other platform, other engines, et cetera, et cetera. And they all based on this pure Java flow API. Uh, uh, so once again, pure standard, no other JVM depend, no other third party dependencies. It's all pure Java JVM that you get out of the box actually. And uh, we have two main constructions. These are the multi and single. If most probably of you, uh, all of you code in, in, in Spring, let's be quite honest, Spring is big. So you probably know uh, Flux and Mono. So multi is Flux and single is Mono. So this is the only difference actually. Uh, so that means that whenever you have to do something with a stream of, of, of uh, event, reactive stream of events, you just call multi, just do something and you will get it. If you have only one thing happening, you're just single. Very straightforward in terms of, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> uh, in terms of actually base of the framework. And as I say, instead of using this uh, subscription, subscribers, etc., use reactive streams operator. And Helidon provides you a bunch of them. So of course everybody knows flat map. It can go to completion stage, through publishers, to everything you need. You have disting, you have on error, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, uh, like outcome, if you use your reactive, uh, reactive engines, they all have a bunch of operators to make your life easier. Uh, that was a joke. And here we also actually have a big set of operators, but they're all like completely, purely Java, um, how you say, in, uh, let's put it this way, they are not depending on everything else. So they are in the base of the framework. That means that you can easily chain these operators. Like for example, you have a processor, uh, you just do uh, in a reactive way a stream of events. You just process it, like for example, get in the upper stream like here, and then you compose this data as it's uh, asynchronously done. And whenever it's done, it will be printed. So that means that uh, with this, program, we actually, if you remember the first image when we, there's a gap that we have to fill, we're actually filling the gap uh, of using your processor as much as possible. And uh, with this operators, we are quite happy that uh, our competitors like are really quick, but we are sometimes quicker, sometimes twice quicker. That means you can do more stuff just because you have an uh, engine which is completely independent and it works separately. And as a result, here you have so-called reactive server. So it means that it's not only the reactive framework, but around it, we build a reactive web server, which is, <coughs> once again, pure Java code, which is asynchronously serving the requests. You see, it's just a construction with this web server. You just create a root. Uh, I will show you in a minute a demo. And whenever it's done, it just works easily. So. Uh, let me actually show you a demo. Yes, I will just put on a common line here. Um, we will go to a demo folder, CD demo folder. And I will create a small application for you. And this small application will be created very easily because we have a special tune, uh, just a small application called Helidon which helps you create your application and actually work with them uh, as it provides a developer way of uh, developer loop. 
So we will create a small uh, startup. And technically, we will just open it in idea. So where is it? Uh, it's quick start SES. Uh, and you will see that just few Java files can make a real micro service, which is really small, tiny, which actually does what, oops, sorry, which actually is completely asynchronous. And as you see, you just have main methods here. Uh, so what that means, we have a web server. You see it's returned as a single. That means it's asynchronous. So whenever it's done, there is, it will be created in an asynchronous way, and it will start working in an asynchronous way. You just create the server, very easy, with a builder pattern. We use builder patterns everywhere. And once again, whenever it's done, print that it's done. Exceptionally, if it fails, just do it gracefully. That means that we have this data flow and we have the exception flow of events. So we are really following the reactive paradigm. And here we have something which is called routing. So you just say that for this URL, there is a one server, service, greet service, which is quite, quite, you know, stupid. As I said, we only use one annotation here, which is overwrite. And here we say, for this route, associate this function. If you go to the function, it will just have request response. Do something with it. Uh, once again, so extremely simple, and it is asynchronous at its base, actually. So now, by the way, we don't even need to compile and run it. Since it's a pure, uh, pure Java code, the only thing we should do, oops, I think I've changed something. Sorry for that. Yes, we just have to to run it maybe directly from the EDE. We don't need to do all this maven stuff and all. And in fractions of second, you've got a real working server. Uh, we will just try it. So we'll do curl greet, for example. Greet. And you see, it, it works. Greet Barcelona. I won't go much into the details. It's just generated for you. You can have a look at it. By the way, this tool, Helidon, it's also pure Java. It's just a native image of, uh, it's written in Java. And it's distributed as a native image for three platforms. So only Java, what we do. And uh, it's not only like, you know, doing simple stuff and stupid stuff, you even can do metrics. So that means we are ready for the clouds themselves. So you read metrics in Prometheus format here. And you can also read health information, for example. So whenever you do something, you already have all the infrastructure for you to run in the clouds in a synchronous way. So it was just, just to tell you actually that Helidon itself, in a reactive way, is also a product, although it's like a favor, uh, flavor. But uh, as I told you, being reactive, throwing away all the magic there, it uh, itself is self-contained and uh, can do really can can work with a lot of big volumes of information. I will just show you a little bit later in this talk. So. The next thing, actually, is, as I told you, reactive messaging itself. So um, what is good about that, that before actually going to, into messaging, um, as you know, we are like micro-profile specific uh, in terms of you know, working with specification. So uh, there was a specification made especially for reactive messaging in micro-profile. So, uh, send messages, send and receive messages in a convenient way with back pressure, with acknowledgement mechanism, and uh, it has to be like a reactive pipeline. So you can easily connect several APIs, and you can easily actually change the engines which are underneath. That means that you have an abstraction, you send a message. The message it's broker itself can be Kafka Active MQ, GMS, or a socket, for example, and you just have a connector, and 
you work with abstractions. So you send and receive messages with abstractions, and you do it, once again, in a reactive way. So that means that from the beginning, if we want, once again talk in, uh, in, a, in a little bit enterprise-ish way, we just have to annotate something as an outgoing message, and we can produce reactive stream of messages. Uh, we can produce an easy way like a multi of these messages, which is a done way of doing this thing. Or we can work with, with Rx Java, for example, with flowable producing several events. And of course, Project Reactor with Flux, we can just produce several events. And as a result, uh, we can consuming with just incoming uh, of receiving messages. So once again, it's, it's an abstraction which is quite easy for you. And uh, it is standard way. That means that whenever you drop your code uh, from another, another vendor, it will work. Uh, so you can read more information about messaging what in, uh, in micro-profile you know, specifications and actually how Helidon supports it. But Helidon took it one step further. So as we are reactive from the very beginning, we said, OK, if we just remove all this, uh, all this, um, uh, all this you know, uh, uh, um, I will call it EE uh, packaging or not packaging, like you know, all this enterprise-ish stuff, and just reuse our engine uh, at its maximum, we are able to do this really, uh, really in a, in a fast and really uh, powerful way. So we had just introduced only one abstraction here, which is like a channel which connects a publisher and subscriber. In the middle, you can just put a processor. So as you say, we just create a channel. Uh, you got to make a publisher which just puts some messages, as you see, in a reactive way. So just multi of some messages. And then you have a listener, actually, which consumes these messages and just from that channel just prints them out. In the middle, of course, you can put a processor, which is subscriber to the upstream and a publisher to the downstream. So you can change your stuff in the middle. So for example, here we have even several channels which work together. We, we, uh, together with each other, we just uh, put a stream of messages. Then we take them to uppercase, that we make it in another channel and print them out. So uh, it, it sounds like a little bit, you know, Maybe strange to you, but if you work with a lot of information here, you um, you uh, can process great volumes of information. So it's technically in Helidon SC you get the same microprofile messages, but with no magic philosophy of uh, of uh, you know putting annotations. And uh, once again, the connectors. So you can easily connect to Kafka, JMS, uh, Active uh, IQ, and quite soon you will have also our socket connection. So once again, you start thinking in reactive way, but actually, if you start thinking in reactive way, once reactive, always reactive. This is one of the problems maybe of the reactive programming. It's both benefit and programs. That means that if you work with database, for example, it is blocking. Um, like 80 JDBC driver is a blocking driver. So uh, we're not talking about R2DBC right now, but JDBC, for example, is blocking. So we cared about this in Helidonis too, so we created an asynchronous driver, which is a wrapper around, around any JDBC driver. It runs in a separate executor, so you can start talking to your database in a synchronous way as well. So you just have to say, just in a transaction, do me a query, execute. But uh, the result of this transaction, for example, will be just a single which is like a, which promise data that will, will come, and you can work it in asynchronous way and in a reactive way, as I told you, thus uh, making all of your program reactive. The same is the web client. So as you know, um, uh, the services consume data, not only produce data, but consume. So you get the same web client, which actually can read your data asynchronously. Uh, it's just to say that once again, you can have all the flow of events, all from the beginning to the end. Everything can be done completely asynchronously in Helidon with this reactive engine. But, you know, here we come to the interesting part, actually. Is blocking so bad? You know? Uh, and here we come to something which is amazing, and it's called Project Loom. 
So you see, um, whenever I did this demonstration to you with all that code, I didn't dive much into it, but uh, um, writing in a reactive way is officially hard, I would say. You have to put a lot of more uh, thoughts in what you're doing, and uh, making really great performance applications is hard. So that's why I Project Loom, which is a research project, which was actually a research project, or still actually is in the phase of transition, was established with the idea to <coughs> produce something which is called virtual threads. And it actually varied this year, I guess it was in, uh, in, uh, in uh, April, actually. The JEP was published, that means that the project itself is not only a research project, but it's actually became like a feature or like preview feature of the, of the JVM itself. So we have received another very interesting way to deal with threads. And what is this way actually? So uh, uh, the, the idea of virtual threads, um, for us developers, technically, this is the same thread. We, we, we think uh, we have the same API, we have the same mindset when we work with threads, but just with the idea that JVM actually cares to uh, mount and unmount this thread on real threads, because, you know, once again, Threads is a very, um, uh, I would say, uh, first of all, limited resource because you know for every thread you have to have a lot of memory. I would say, and uh, for the threads you have to, well, I would say, you can't have a lot of them, and you have to really care about them as a limited resource. And with the introduction of uh, virtual threads, uh, you still think that this is a normal thread, but the JVM actually cares for you how this thread amounts it and unmounts it from the real threads that you have from your operating system. So once again, if the virtual thread is blocked, it is unmounted from the carrier thread by the JVM, making room for the others. Uh, once the thread is like unlocked, the JVM will, with its schedule, we have a look if there is a free space and it will run this thread again. Uh, once again, it's based on the continuation as API, and technically you actually don't have to do anything uh, for you to have a lot of these threads. That means that virtual threads, you can have millions of them. So they actually don't block real threads, which are, you know, uh, limited resource and they're hard to, uh, and they, by the API, are the same. So you, in a moment, you, you can work with millions of threads without actually uh, understanding, or not understanding, actually experiencing all the problems with that. Uh, the API, uh, it, it is subject to change, but it had just has some few new me methods that actually just uh, create a new virtual thread executor, and you can start virtual threads with them, especially, but uh, it's so small and nice that Helidon, from the very beginning, of this project actually already has support for virtual threads. You only have to make one option, like true, and it will use virtual threads. And uh, let us actually make a small example here to see how it actually works, to see the difference. So uh, we will make um, a small, um, small set of microservices, one with some slow microservice which is blocking call, like for example, blocking DB, and a quick, which responds immediately. If long operation blocks a threat, the quick operation cannot actually reuse this resource and will break with timeout. In uh, usual ways how to fix that, we have to, for example, put more threads. Of course, it will not work. Another option will be rewrite it in the reactive way, which is cool because Helidon actually provides you this way of doing things. You just rewrite it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a reactive way, and you stop blocking. You're asynchronous, you are reactive. You have to do everything reactive. Or you have to switch to Loom, and we will see, actually, if this works. So I have created, uh, not me, actually, uh, a colleague of mine have created a small demo project uh, 
let me let me just open it here. Yes, which has two microservices. Um, and actually one microservice with two endpoints and two clients. So the first client, as I said, is small. It's nothing, it just reads, reads uh, information. Yes, sometimes idea can make issues. It's just a web client that pulls data from the server. And there is a quick, uh, no, this was the quick one, and there is a quick who actually tests a quick microservice to see how much information, he, how, many, how many requests he can do. And uh, there is a resource. It's, it's very small. So you just have quick, which is returns done. And uh, you have a slow, which actually sleeps. Very, very, uh, very easy. And what usually happens when we run it, but first of all, as I told you, in Helidon, you only have one option to switch to enable, enable virtual threat. You can enforce them as well. But you just enable virtual threats, and all the requests actually go through virtual threats. So if we, if we run it, uh, let us have a look how the system behaves. So just give me a second to, to start a terminal. I very much like this setup that I'm going to show you right now because uh, it has several windows. Just give me a second to open it. Uh, yeah, window group conference. Oh, yes, it works right now. Oh, no. No, sorry, my bad. It opened tons of them. So I just close this thing, open a new terminal. Uh, it's always an issue for me because I always forget that if you open multiple things, they will open it as, yes, now it's better. So the only thing we have to do is to switch to JDK, uh, which actually supports that thing. So for me, it's very easy. So I said just JDK 19. So here we have Loom support. I will switch to JDK here, JDK. Uh, JDK19, and here I also switch to JDK19. So what we will do, we will start the first client, which is quick, which does quick pulse. For example, for, for something which should happen really quickly, uh, we do it. So it's just a pure Java, once written in, uh, in Helidon. Um, Java minus jar, target, yes. We will start the slow pulse here. We will start the fast pulse here. For now, you see it just receives errors just because nothing has been served. And now we will run our server without loom option. So we'll just say no loom. It loads so quickly and what you see? you suddenly see that you started like, we limited this to 10, 10 threads, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this server, uh, this, uh, this thread pool, and you see that it does like, you know, try to get requests, but all the long requests actually block the threads, and for quick responses, you get a lot of errors. So this is a typical situation that you don't actually want to use. By the way, let us see what Hashtop says. That means that we're doing a ready to serve a lot, but the processor is like doing nothing. Before switching to Loom, we have, I have like written a program which does absolutely the same in reactive way. So we do the same server, the same service uh, in a reactive way. So as I told you, reactive is cool. So we just written it in a reactive way. It's very fast and what you see you see suddenly the, uh, the long requests are doing as they should, but the short requests are having room for them to be served. That means that we're starting utilizing because it's unblocking, because it's uh, reactive, and it's asynchronous. So we suddenly started utilizing our processor uh, in the best way. We start serving the requests. It is reactive way of doing things. 
once again, oh, Elidon provides these flavors. So if you rewrite it in, in, uh, in uh, this option, it will just simply work for you. And suddenly, you start utilizing your processors at really maximum values. Once again, as you see, just a comparison with Helidon MP and Helidon SE in terms of reactive can be really, really performant. But let's now do a little bit different stuff. Now, we just enable the option of Loom, um, which is like one option, as I told you. What happens? One of a sudden, the behavior of, of, uh, of uh, blocking way of doing code is starting to be quite similar to reactive. We suddenly started, like, you know, serving the requests, although technically they are blocked. But since they all run virtual, so virtual threads, JVM takes care of, you know, seeing what is blocked, what is unblocked, and doing this scheduling for us. We well, see you don't have the same numbers, like, you know, 30,000 requests or like 31,000 requests. But as you see, as the JVM gets hot, uh, you suddenly, with a blocky code, became doing something which is, which is like, you know, the same as reactive in terms of performance without actually re writing the reactive code, which is, uh, which is a big game changer, actually. And Helidon, once again, with just one option, supports this thing out of the box. So, and as a result, let me just close this thing, not to, like, you know, use the resources as much as possible. Um, we come to a situation, actually, reactive is cool, but what if we do, once again, it's very easy to rewrite. You probably don't even need to rewrite anything. Uh, it's perfect for the enterprise, just because a lot of people may use it again and again without rewriting this thing. But as you see, Reactive is still actually faster, at least in this machine. So, but, uh, but uh, Loom, in combination with Helidon, of course, is a great option. But we came to the situation, okay, we know that Netty underneath is asynchronous. Why don't we make a special synchron, like, you know, blocking server, uh, which is only based on Loom? And we came to something which is called NEMA. So it's a Loom-based web server, which is going to be open source, like, I believe, tomorrow, quite honestly. So you are, like, one of the few people who actually know that there's a big world premiere coming. <laughs> that uh, it's a blocking server made completely on JVM. There are no external libraries. There's no native code, as in, uh, for example, Netty, that has native stuff there. Uh, our platform specific stuff. It's JVM only stuff, which actually has the same performance or even better performance using new features like virtual threads, like the hand switch, like seal classes and system logo, everything you need from Java, you know, 17, I would say. So pure Java, which as a result gives you performance which is sometimes higher than that of Natty. And um, it's, I believe it's quite amazing. The only thing you need is a JVM, which supports Loom. Um, and uh, as Loom now has become like a preview feature, so it's gonna come in our JVMs, Elidon is already prepared for you uh, a server which actually has a maximum performance in a blocking way. So open sourcing is like in progress, but I believe it will happen like in a few days. And why I say in a few days, because just right now we are writing the final notes for Helidon 3, which is gonna be released today, uh, not today, tomorrow, I believe is the, is the deadline for us. And uh, with it, actually you will have NEMA also open source there. With Helidon, by the way, just a small announcement, so it's a really big, big milestone for us. It's fully Jakartified. It's supposed to, it supports the latest microprofile. Uh, it's been with a lot of enhancements. You will have full release notes quite soon. So our team has been working really hard for that to happen. And I'm really pleased to announce that, like tomorrow, I believe, we will have our official tweet saying that Helidon 3.0 has been released 
and you're finally able to use it. So uh, whenever you want to know more information about Helidon, with its, uh, with its uh, one or two flavors and doing that reactive or blocking way, this is the, uh, these are the official channels, like uh, Twitter, Medium. We record videos who don't like reading. <laughs> and you can ask all the questions in Slack in six languages. We answer in all languages. So as a summary, reactive is awesome, once again. So we saw that rewriting your code in reactive way, throwing away all this uh, real, you know, uh, CDI magic, et cetera, et cetera, can boost your performance in a maximum way. But you have to do everything reactive since then. If you are, don't want to do this, uh, there is blocking and there is loom, which is coming. And uh, you know, you will be able just very easily to run your code in a much better performance just by one option, actually. So this is everything I want to tell you. I hope it was useful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? Yes? Ah, oh, there's another one. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, not about Helidon question, but regarding Reactive and Loom. So first, we wrote other things in threads, like it was our life. Now we rewrite everything to Reactive, and now Loom is coming. So will we have the back process of writing from everything from Reactive to Loom when Loom will come as fast as Reactive? What do you think about that? I, I think that yes. <laughs> you will have more work to do, and you will be paid for that. Uh, yes, uh, that's a good option. So my personal understanding, Klaus, so first of all, let Loom come. Uh, it, it, is, it is coming quite fast. But uh, it's still not going to happen like today or tomorrow. Uh, it's still going to happen in, I believe, a uh, year or something so far. Uh, uh, Nikolai, what is, the, what is the release date, you know? Preview feature in Nitrous? Yes. Nobody knows how it takes for it to be finalized, but it's probably not going to be 20. Yes, so. It needs it because it's a fundamental change. So maybe 21, I guess. But still, it's, it's, you can already, already play with it. But uh, yes, a lot of code which was blocking and useless at some moment may be easily adopted to Loom. I believe so. Uh, and um, um, yes, you will have more work to do. <laughs> yes. Awesome presentation. Uh, one question out of curiosity. Did you do those tests with Nima? Uh, what, sorry? The, the, ah, the same test the demo that you, you showed us. Did you, you see, do this uh, with Dima? I, uh, it's not yet open sourced. I mean, whenever it is open sourced, uh, I will do the same as much as possible. I think I will post a video about that on YouTube channel. Uh, because now we have uh, just, you know, internal discussion that if you even do Helidon S, uh, SE, which is like, you know, asynchronous, with Nima running instead of instead of uh, Netty, you will have double the performance with them. So it's mind-blowing. But uh, once again, these are just, once again, this is a disclaimer, I would say. Everything is subject to change because, you know, uh, all the updates from, uh, we, are, we have the benefit to be in very close contact with Loom team. And uh, this is why uh, there's always changes and something may happen. But as it's done, it will be published, of course. So any more questions? Well, you, you can easily find me. I'm like, you know, in a wheelchair. Uh, ask me whenever you have, you know, uh, other question coming. I'll be hanging around. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias.